Welcome back to CoreyM, the official podcast of the NYU Bellevue Emergency Medicine Residency Program. I'm Breed C. And I'm Brian Gaberti. So what are we talking about this week, Bree? Well, New York just got hit with our first major snowstorm of the year. And with this cold weather, we're seeing needs rise for medical care, warmth, food, and shelter with arguably one of our most vulnerable populations, patients experiencing homelessness. Fortunately, we're joined by one of our own EM physicians, Dr. Kelly Duran, who has been on the front lines of researching social determinants of health, including homelessness, and developing impactful solutions to such a widespread, multifactorial, and complicated issue. In one of her most recent publications, she writes, When a distinguishing feature of people living on the streets is the number of hospital identification bracelets, most obtained in EDs, circling their wrists, it is clear that the ED is part of the problem and must be part of the solution to fixing homelessness. Yeah, that is so true. We're very grateful that Dr. Duran has joined us today. Dr. Duran is an emergency physician at Bellevue and a faculty member in the Department of Population Health and the Department of Emergency Medicine at NYU School of Medicine. She completed her EM residency here at NYU Bellevue and earned her Master's of Health Science as a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Clinical Scholar at Yale University. Her research on homelessness and emergency department use has been published in journals including the American Journal of Public Health, Medical Care, and the Annals of Emergency Medicine. She's spoken around the country as an expert on social determinants of health and holds grants from the NIH and the CDC. So welcome to Corey M. Kelly. Thank you so much for having me. So Kelly, your recent commentary in Annals of Emergency Medicine was striking. Some takeaways that really stuck with me included the fact that nearly 550,000 people are homeless on any given night across the country. And out of the 1.5 million people who use a homeless shelter at least once during the course of a year, More than one-third are kids and people and families. I know that I'm not the only ED physician who struggles with how to provide meaningful care and even change the cycle for these patients. There are few things more heartbreaking and frustrating than having to discharge a patient back into the street. Yes, the scale of homelessness in the United States is really astounding, and it's a real tragedy for every individual who experiences it. In the emergency department, we're the eyes of social ills, we're the front door of the healthcare system. So we see social ills like homelessness really clearly in the emergency department. It's also important to note that homelessness itself is a reflection of multiple other social problems. It's a reflection of inadequate income supports. It's a reflection of inadequate affordable housing. There are large racial disparities in homelessness, so it's also a reflection of structural racism. And Kelly, how are health outcomes for patients experiencing homelessness compared to those with stable housing? Uh, Worse. Worse, really, across the board. Um, Homelessness both affects health uh, and people's health can sometimes lead them to be homeless. So it can oftentimes be a you know, chicken or egg issue or, or more like a vicious spiral. So people who are homeless have physical health problems. They have basically higher rates of almost every chronic illness across the board. They also have higher rates of substance use and mental health problems than people who aren't homeless. Um, People who are homeless experience environmental exposures. They have risks from living on the streets if they're outside, for example, risks of hypothermia, risks of injuries. And then one thing that's coming out in more recent research is that uh, we've learned that people who are homeless have premature aging, essentially. What we're learning from research out of California by Margot Cashel and others is that people who are homeless have high rates of what are called geriatric syndromes. These are things such as urinary incontinence, frequent falls, trouble with balance, trouble with memory. And what we know is that people who are homeless have rates of these problems in their 50s that mirror rates for people who aren't homeless in their 70s or 80s. So essentially, you know, when somebody is homeless and they're in their 50s, that's that's essentially elderly for somebody who's homeless. And what we're also learning is that throughout the country, the number of people who are homeless and who are older is increasing due to a a number of mainly demographic type reasons. But some research that colleagues and I did out of University of Pennsylvania found um, that we are predicting that in by 2030 in the United States, there will be around 106,000 people who are homeless and over the age of 65. And then people who are homeless also have very high mortality rates. They have 
mortality rates you know, more than two or three times higher than people who aren't homeless. In New York City, we have around 300 deaths per year of people who are homeless. A new report just came out in Los Angeles. They had over a thousand deaths of people who were homeless uh, last in the last year that they counted it. And in general, it's been found that people who are homeless die on average 20 years earlier than people who aren't homeless. So this is a really serious issue for people's health. With all of that, though, it's just important to note that this isn't a homogenous population. So a lot of the most severe health issues, and also where we see things like the very frequent emergency department use, a lot of that is concentrated among people who are what we are what we call chronically homeless. Those are people who have been homeless for long periods of time and who also have a disabling condition. Most people experience homelessness transiently or for short periods of time or might have several shorter episodes of homelessness. And for those people, the health consequences aren't quite as severe. But what we do know from past research is that even people with short episodes of homelessness and even people who have housing instability short of homelessness do have worse health than people who are stably housed. Wow. I mean... It's interesting that you talk about the elderly cohort and the geriatric syndromes because I have noticed, especially in Bellevue, that there's a lot of older people coming in. Um, and I, I think you just wrote a really interesting commentary. Was it the New York Times? I wrote a letter to the editor in the New York Times that was commenting both on our research that I mentioned and also on the fact that, like you, I have been observing in the emergency department more and more people who are elderly and homeless. The emergency department, to me, is really like a canary in the coal mine. And so just you know, even in recent years, there's just been more and more people coming through our emergency department at Bellevue that are in their 50s and homeless, 60s and homeless. I had somebody in their 80s who was homeless, and they have multiple chronic medical conditions. And it's really heartbreaking because many of them are, are truly you know, not, should not be living uh, in the shelters or on the streets. Yeah, absolutely. Kelly, what are some examples of unconscious or even conscious bias that we as ED providers have regarding patients experiencing homelessness? You know, I had a really enlightening experience recently where I was invited by somebody to join a Facebook support group for people who are experiencing homelessness. And the moderator of the group posed a question for me to the group, which was, what do you want doctors to know about people who are homeless and what have your experiences been like? And the stories that they told were really heartbreaking and really highlighted a lot of the bias that people who are homeless face in the healthcare system. We had people that told stories, frankly, where they were treated as barely human, let alone given good medical care. There were stories, for example, of people in the emergency department who were behind a curtain and they could hear the doctors and nurses talking about them on the other side of the curtain talking about how you know they were just there for a sandwich or how they didn't really need medical care. And that's you know obviously not how we should be treating people. And I think that sort of bias does influence the type of care that we provide. And so it's important to try to protect against it where we can. So that's an excellent topic to bring up. And I think most programs don't have this incorporated into their training. What type of curriculum can be added to emergency medicine training that would better prepare us providers to combat this problem? You're right. Most emergency medicine residencies that I've heard of, at least, do not have formal training related to homelessness. We had done a study of this, actually, with some colleagues back when I was doing fellowship at Yale that was a qualitative study with emergency medicine residents about their experiences caring for people who were homeless. And what we learned is that in the absence of a formal curriculum on homelessness, they often learned by example from attendings who may or may not have been doing the right thing when it came to caring for their patients who were homeless. And they also learned from essentially misses. We saw this phenomenon where people would learn from hearing, for example, about someone who was homeless who was assumed to have just been intoxicated, who later was found to, to have a head bleed. And obviously, we don't really want to rely on learning from either of those mechanisms. There's not good research to guide us about what type of curriculum would be most beneficial, though. In my opinion, a good first step would be doing what we can to really humanize the uh, patients who are homeless. So rather than just trying to expose residents to more and more 
patients who are homeless, which actually might have the reverse effect in dehumanizing that that population. I think that we need to find ways for our learners to have meaningful interactions with people who are homeless so that they can hear their stories and really learn and in a very visceral way that these are real people with real hopes and real fears and real desires just like you and me. And that seems silly or sad to even have to say, but I think that when you're working day after day in a busy emergency department, it's very easy for patients to be dehumanized, even for the most compassionate providers. I mean, this is something that I even saw in myself when I was going through residency training and at Bellevue and just seeing so many patients day after day. I could you know, tell that I was starting to see people as less human and had to really take a, take a step back from that. And so I think think to me this is the first important component of any type of education for our residents. I'm not sure the best way to do that. There are some good resources. There's a website run by a man named Mark Horvath, who was formerly formerly homeless himself. He has a website called Invisible People, and he interviews people who are experiencing homelessness. Now, they're not very long interviews, maybe 10 minutes, 15 minutes, but he talks to them and you get to hear their stories. And so things like that might be a good resource for teaching our residents. And then, of course, there are some very concrete practical skills that we can teach our learners. For example, it's very important to ask people about their housing status in a sensitive way to inform our treatment plans. It's important to do a full physical exam for people who are homeless, just like other patients as well. That all makes sense. It sounds like we have a long way to go. Um, In order to improve the health of undomiciled patients, the healthcare system and relevant agencies as a whole need to make drastic changes on so many levels, on institutional, policy, resource, insurance, and funding levels. So what can we as ED providers do to best help our patients experiencing homelessness? You know, on a day-to-day and very basic level, very simply, I think we can provide the best possible medical care that we can for patients who are homeless, and that includes knowing about their housing situation so that we can treat them appropriately. I do think that giving someone clothing when they need it, even just a pair of socks, a sandwich, is a human kindness and also can go a long way towards building a therapeutic relationship with our patients. And then obviously connecting people with social work or other community resources for which they might be eligible can also be valuable. More broadly, though, there's there's a lot of money and there's a lot of power in healthcare. And I think that we have some thinking to do about what it might mean in terms of the potential influence we can have on homelessness and how to best bring to bear some of the resources of the healthcare system to affect the issue of homelessness. That's obviously such an important part of health. One of the other things just to mention is that at the beginning, you mentioned that the winter is coming up. It's important for emergency providers to know about what types of policies might be in place in their localities around what their responsibilities might be or what they can do to help people who are homeless and who are staying on the streets in the winter. In New York City, we have something called Code Blue. That's essentially when the wind chill goes below 32 degrees on any given night. It's called a Code Blue night. And hospitals are asked on those nights to allow people who are homeless to wait even after their treatment is completed um, in the waiting room or in the treatment area. Um, And so it's important that we're not, during Code Blue nights especially, sending people out to the streets where it could be dangerous for them. Ultimately, though, what I think your question identifies is that homelessness is is a much larger structural and social problem. And while the emergency department and the healthcare system more broadly can definitely contribute to preventing or ending homelessness for some people, the big picture is that to bring that 550,000 homeless people down, um, homeless people per year number down, will require large-scale local, state, and a lot of federal investments in affordable housing and other programs. As ED providers, we can still have a role, though. I think that we can help there by using our voices to bear witness to what we see in the emergency department in terms of the influence of homelessness on people's health, and we can advocate for housing policies that will help our patients. We shouldn't underestimate the potential power that we have with our voices. That's very well put, Kelly. This is a very complex problem, as you described, that requires many interventions at differing levels. Are there any current ED initiatives that you think are particularly impactful? There are. There are things happening all throughout the country. I'm not aware of all of them, obviously, but some of the ones that I'm aware of to mention. 
There is a movement towards some hospitals employing what are being called housing navigators. These are generally people that come from a housing background. They might, for example, be an employee of a community-based organization that focuses on housing, and they're brought in to work in that emergency department or elsewhere in the hospital, specifically to work with patients who have housing needs. They can do things like helping to connect people to shelters, helping to apply for permanent supportive housing, helping people to to get other resources related to housing. That's important because housing is a really complex issue. And our social work colleagues, we should definitely rely on. But housing itself is so complex that that sometimes it's helpful to have somebody who has very specific training in housing. Another initiative, which is one that I've been involved with in the past, is something called medical respite programs. These are places where people who are homeless can go when they're too sick to be on the streets or in a shelter, but not sick enough to need to be in a hospital bed. So for example, somebody who is homeless and who has a cellulitis and needs to elevate their leg and needs some antibiotics, but um, they shouldn't be you know, in a shelter where they're kicked out during the daytime and have to walk around all day, something like that. There's really a whole variety of patients for whom this might be appropriate. And these are places that exist throughout the country. There's you know, 60, 70, 80 of them throughout the country. They, ha- they all look a little bit different. The models differ across the country, but they are resources for patients that have generally what's considered to be a somewhat time-limited medical need. And in New Haven, Connecticut, I worked with other emergency department, other hospital providers, and with our local homeless services agency, Columbus House, and a variety of other uh, people, stakeholders in New Haven, and we started a medical respite program that serves patients who we were seeing in the hospital who had those sorts of needs. So that's definitely a role that emergency departments could could help with and contribute to. And then there's even bigger picture stuff going on. For example, in, um, in Chicago, Stephen Brown is the social worker and he's the director of preventive emergency medicine there. And they've done really exciting work related to actually funding and providing housing for some of the high need patients who are homeless and who are using that hospital. In general, within the healthcare system, we've seen this huge wave of interest in housing and social determinants of health over the past several years. So it's pretty easy these days to find new stories about these sorts of initiatives. The American Hospital Association and National Academies of Sciences have both put out reports on the role that the healthcare system can play for housing and other social determinants of health. And I think that emergency medicine in general could probably play a larger role in some of these initiatives. You're obviously involved in so much research, conducting research um, in terms of trying to help the healthcare system and patients experiencing homelessness. What other research projects are you currently working on, Kelly? Right now, I'm working on two main projects. The first is a study that was funded by NIDA, the National Institutes on Drug Abuse of the NIH, and by the United Hospital Fund. And that is a study that examines the intersection of homelessness and substance use and also looks at whether we can predict homelessness amongst our emergency department patients. So what I mean by that is whether we can identify risk factors and develop screening tools that lets us tell which of the patients that we're seeing who aren't homeless at the time that we're seeing them are likely to become homeless in the next several months. Because as for everything, uh, sometimes prevention is the best way to go. And in homeless services in general, there's a big push towards trying to prevent people from becoming homeless in the first place. So that's one of the studies that I'm working working on. The other study that I'm just starting is funded by the CDC, and for that study, I am the principal investigator along with Dr. Jennifer McNeely, who's in our Department of Population Health here at NYU School of Medicine. And that study isn't focused explicitly on homelessness. That study is a study of our Department of Health and Mental Hygiene's Relay program in New York City. Relay is a program that employs peer navigators to respond to emergency department patients who have presented after an opioid overdose. And so we're going to be studying 
that program. While that study isn't specific to homelessness, what the Department of Health has found in looking at this program early on is that 29% of the patients that they've served so far through this program actually are homeless on the streets or the shelter. And I think that's something that's under-recognized, this intersection between overdose and opioid overdose and homelessness and something that's important for emergency department providers to know. Now, Kelly, before we wrap up, you know, we've worked together for over a year now. And with such dedication and direction, I have to ask, how did you get started in this work? Oh, that's a that's a good question. So I have actually been doing homelessness related work for longer than I've been doing medicine. I started doing homelessness work as an undergrad. I did my undergrad at Harvard and there we had at the time one student run homeless shelter. Now I believe they have two. And I got very involved in that shelter. I became a supervisor, which meant that I spent one night a week overnight at the shelter and then eventually became one of the student directors of that shelter. And just once I, you know, heard people's stories, it was pretty hard for me to turn away from the issue. I also studied sociology as an undergrad, so I had a focus on urban poverty and homelessness. After undergrad, I went to California and I spent a year working on a research study with people who were homeless or formerly homeless. And basically, I've just continued working on homelessness ever since then, really through I've had, you know, the opportunity to to do a wide variety of programs and projects and research related to homelessness. It's a, a topic that's always been a passion of mine and actually what brought me here to Bellevue in the first place. Excellent. Well, very impactful work, Kelly. And thank you so much for being here at Coriam for your expertise and all the work that you do combating homelessness and improving our care for this population. Thank you so much for having me and for talking about this topic on your podcast. So that's all for this episode. Continue to follow us on Twitter at core underscore EM and visit us on our website, coriam.net. Until the next one, this is Bree, Brian, and Kelly signing off. <laughs>